Good afternoon and welcome to the Committee on Higher Education. Uh, sorry, but our chair is under the weather today, so I uh, will be running the meeting. Uh, today is Wednesday, April 3rd. It's 3 p.m. or 3.01 p.m. We are in room 229. And this uh, meeting is being live, uh, streamed live in the event that something goes wrong or we have any technical difficulties you'll find a link to viewing the options on a senate meetings a live on demand video page of the legislature's website and we will reconvene um, to take the matters up wednesday no let's see when are we reconvening if anything goes wrong monday monday april 8th and to remind our testifiers that due to time restrictions on our hearings, we'll be limiting testimonies to one minute per testifier per bill. And for those of you who are participating remotely, you can remain muted. And when your name is called, we will let you in. Uh, let's see. Members, we only have one measure on the agenda. So we're going to hear all the testimonies and then open up to questions. So the first item being, House Bill 2577, House Draft 1, authorizes Department of Health to require the Department of Education to report Corona disease 2019 potential outbreaks or other public health emergencies and related information in a manner most appropriate to public health and safety. As determined by the Department of Health, repeals the requirement to publish the report on the Department of Education's website. And starting out with our first testifier is Keith Ayashi. Aloha, Vice Chair Kim, members Aloha. of the committee. Keith Ayashi, superintendent, testifying on behalf of the Department of Education. Uh, the department stands on its written testimony in support of this measure. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Department of Health in support. Mr. Kim, members of the committee, aloha. My name is Todd Wilson. I'm the school health advisor here for Dr. Sarah Campbell and uh, Dr. Nathan Tan. Uh, we stand on our written testimony and we're available for questions. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. And we have Anne Horiuchi, uh, Attorney General. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Kim, members, and Harichi, Department of the Attorney General. Um, as we set forth in our testimony, under the bill, there's a theoretical potential for the DOE to be asked to provide personally identifiable information as defined under FERPA. Pursuant to FERPA, the DOE must first determine whether there's a health or safety emergency that warrants the release of personally identifiable information before it can provide such information. To avoid any potential FERPA violations, we provided um, suggested uh, revision to the bill in our testimony. I'll be available for questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to testify? Angela? Aloha. Um, committee, Angela Melody Young testifying on behalf of CARES. Uh, so this um, proposal is a request for DOH and DOE to initiate work together on reporting public health emergencies such as COVID-19 and other similar emergencies. And I agree with AG's comments that under this bill, there is um, theoretical potential to provide personally identifiable information. And my major concern with the bill is privacy laws as per HIPAA Act, which is a federal act to set standards and is not legislated here in this bill to protect minors. The HIPAA privacy rule creates national standards to protect medical records, and it does set a limit and conditions on the uses and disclosures that may be made of such information without authorization. Um, and the privacy rule is located in Chapter 45, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 160, and subparts A and E of Part 164. Um, and it provides comprehensive federal protection um, privacy laws. Um, so the concern is practical because epidemiology information is used to guide public policy. Um, so from the Hawaii Revised Statute Chapter 321, the DOH shall maintain data repositories, charts, patient information, data submission, and epidemiology information for all emergency medical services statewide. So you can, um, or not you, but I wanted to say that with my interpretation of this is that the epidemiological information 
um, needs to be protected. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Any questions, members? Yeah. Senator Favela. So, so at this time, are you guys uh, putting up on the website or giving um, private or personal information to anyone consenting to any kind of help and uh, help risk to the public of the community? Currently, we, thank you, Senator. Uh, currently, for our COVID reporting, uh, we are reporting just the number of cases per school. I think the concern is that uh, when the cases are numbers are low, I believe currently from March, October to March, they're averaging uh, six cases a day statewide. Um, that could um, potentially, uh, because the caseload is small, it could be, be interpreted and possibly identify those students who may be out. I think that's a concern. So that's the reason why um, you guys don't want to report the amount of kids that might be infected due to um, their names might be figured out that that's why they're not in school? That, that might be one possibility. I think the main reason for us for the request uh, to rescind um, the the uh, for the we, our support of this measure is that um, from when the measure was the law was first enacted to now uh, the number of COVID cases has dramatically decreased. Uh, yet the um, requirement is still that uh, schools report uh, their cases. So they have been doing that, um, but where we are now in terms of the total number of COVID cases um, statewide has dramatically decreased. Hence, we're asking for this uh, to be repealed. I mean, I understand the, um, the need of keeping the individual's um, information quiet, but I mean, are you guys having a difficult time managing this uh, site to letting uh, how much cases of the community has? Um, it, uh, it, it is an additional requirement for our schools to uh, input the data. Right. Um, when the, the situation currently from when it, when it was first enacted, the number of COVID cases had dramatically decreased. Uh, we, we do, though, uh, should um, this, this measure pass, uh, definitely will continue our partnership with the Department of Health. And if there is any other requirements that uh, the Department of Health uh, would require of us yes. in moving forward in this or any other case, uh, we definitely committed to supporting and working together with them. So just uh, um, putting the information of schools that are having infection on the website is probably we're not going to have that, but you guys still yet reporting to the Department of Health of each school that has an outbreak, whether it's one or two. You guys still report any cases or any kind of health cases to the Department of Health because what I'm reading this to is not just with coronavirus, but any kind of health uh, issue similar to the outbreak of coronavirus. It's if, if there are um, uh, the Department of Health uh, so designates that we uh, need to require um, reporting to them in any kind of in, an outbreak, uh, potentially, then we would definitely do that. Um, as, as I shared, uh, whatever they would uh, require of us, we would work together with them to determine what the best um, move forward would be. All right, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Is any other questions? Oh, yes. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, Superintendent, as I see, this is almost a little bit of a housekeeping deal, kind of moving forward. And then, Department of Health, you can come up a second. Um, I think what Senator Favela is getting to, and I agree with him, that we still have the re reporting in place because Department of Health, you'll be tracking statistics if you see a spike of something, correct? This, um, uh, the reporting would actually conclude. So the um, system that we're talking about is called the case reporting tool. It was set up between Department of Health and Department of Education during COVID. And it was a great collaboration and it's been really helpful. Um, at this point, the, um, we would, with the ending of this legislation, we would conclude that system. So that would not be, we would not continue to, to gather that daily or weekly totals from the Department of Education. Okay. But you could. You could require something. 
we have a we actually in this partnership um, you know we've actually created the outbreak reporting tool which gathers uh, other diseases and that's something we've got readily available and we'd like to kind of move forward and have um, the Department of Education uh, kind of move online it's a secure system it's a SharePoint system and so we're in uh, conversation right now about onboarding all of the DOE schools to that system so we would have a mechanism in place for disease reporting that would be a secure system similar to what we have now with COVID but it would be more extensive for other diseases so yeah, go ahead chair no, go ahead. no I just because uh, I, I think the, the intention is to be able to track because if you see a spike of something as Department of Health, that takes care of the community. We know something's coming at us, and I think that's what our concern is. Well, we're uh, we're no longer. Uh, I mean, the the testing that you know the system you originally supported was at the school sites, so we could confirm those tests being positive. We knew they were um, you know well uh, proctored, and the information was the data was clean, so to speak. Now um, the tests are at home tests. We don't. We, we can't really guarantee that even the tests that they're reporting, the, a parent may call in and say that their a child's COVID positive, but that's a home test. And as we know, the home tests have a uh, you know, varying rate of, of accuracy, okay. right? So the system as it stands now is, is not a reliable source for spikes. We're using a lot of different mechanisms, wastewater, uh, we're, we're using you know, hospital um, you know, kind of data and long care, uh, you know, other facilities. To, to really kind of have sentinel or, or advanced warning mechanisms. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you, Chair. So as far as DOE is concerned, so if you folks see anything like of concern, because a lot of times the kids get it first, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you will report it, you have um, a process in place to report. Stuff. If we do see uh, an inordinate amount of uh, cases, in whatever that yeah, may be. Maybe measles or something. Right, right. We definitely we'll be connecting up with the Department of Health. Okay, so uh, you have a process in place? Uh, uh, we has a process in place for the teachers or the school to report? That, that would rise to the level of the principal. Principal would walk to talk with the complex area superintendent. We'd be notified and okay. we'd be contacting the department out right away. Okay. So you, we do have a process. Yes. I just want to know you have a process. Yes. So you know what to follow. Yes. Okay. And so finally, do we need this language then that the AG put in if we're actually repealing this sort of? I would, I would de defer to the Department of the Attorney General. Okay. AG? Thank you. So your language that you're recommending, is it, is it needed if you're not going to be reporting anymore? I think it is needed because it's amend, the bill will amend Act 4 from that um, special session of 2021. So there is still a mechanism in place. And so we want to make sure that going forward that it's clear in statute that DOH cannot um, require the dissemination of any kind of personally identifiable information unless the DOE first makes a determination that there's a health or safety emergency okay. that requires the dissemination of that type of information. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, um, I guess we'll just go into decision making and then take up the, the next question of the GMs separately. Um, so I am going to recommend that we do pass this measure with amendments, uh, change the effective date to upon approval, and also to add in the AG's, AG's language, and to uh, add in the language recommended by the Attorney General. Any other uh, thoughts about this discussion? If not, um, um, thank you. The chair votes aye to amend House Bill 2577 to SD1. Thank you. Uh, chair votes aye. Uh, Senator Hashimoto? I vote aye, and Senator Favell? Aye. Chair, you have four in favor. Motion is adopted. Thank you. And we'll go to our next agenda. Since we didn't adjourn, I don't think I have to gobble back in again. So with that, we are taking up four <coughs> advising consent members. The first one being GM 589, submitting for consideration and confirmation to the Early Learning Board uh, gubernatorial nominee Soma Gandhi for a term to expire 6 30 2027. And let's see, testifying is Yuku Arikawa Cross, Executive Director of the Office of Early Learning. I will stand on our testimony and support. 
Thank you, Yuko. Um, anyone else here wishing to testify on this nomination? Seeing or hearing none, we want to call the nominee. She is on Zoom with us today. Welcome. Hello. Would you like to open with some remarks? Thank you for that opportunity. Um, Aloha, Vice Chair Kim and members of the committee. Mahalo for the opportunity to testify today. I am honored to be considered for this post. I thank Governor Green for the nomination and the many colleagues who submitted testimony on, behalf, on my behalf. I look forward to this opportunity to serve our families and keiki across Hawaii as an early learning board member. I'll bring to the board over 25 years of experience as a health and human service administrator, and I've worked in a number of fields related to keiki. Beyond the subject matter expertise, I care deeply about access and quality learning. I have twin boys who are born and raised on Hawaii Island, and as all parents wish, we want and desire healthy and thriving opportunities for our keiki to grow and to thrive. I hope to integrate my expertise, my passion, collaborative spirit to support the Early Learning Board to meet the responsibilities. I stand by my written testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for your time and consideration and co to our commitment to our communities across the state. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Uh, members, any questions of our nominees? Oh, no, I just wanted to let her know she never have one minute that was for the testifiers. <laughs> So you didn't have to rush your statements, though. <laughs> but I appreciate that. Oh, I have none. OK, anybody else? Um, you've been on the board serving for several months now? Just a couple of meetings. Just a two couple meetings. of meetings, yes. So just As based a... on your two meetings, what what, <laughs> is, what is your observations and your thoughts? Uh, I'm learning, and I know that we're going through a transition with the board uh, as there's more nominees that are coming up, and there will be a whole transition with the board. So. I'm intrigued around how the different expertise will come together and that shift that will be happening. Um, I've enjoyed spending some time with the executive director, Yuko, um, and starting to learn a little bit about um, what are the, what's the work that's happening. Okay, so with the change and with being a wholesale new board coming on mm -hmm. and yourself and one other today that we're confirming, the others will be confirmed I believe uh, next week sometime. Uh, that don't give you seniority. <laughs> You'll be the old member on the board. <laughs> so uh, any thoughts as far as uh, what kind of leadership you can provide, mm. if any? <laughs> you know, I think this is an opportunity to co-create and co-learn together. We'll all be going through the newness of all of this. And um, my goal is to support the executive director to the best of our ability and, and help provide direction and strategy and priority support for her and her team. You know, I, I strongly believe that early learning is very <clears throat> important to our youth, but I also for, believe as strongly that um, being nurtured at home and with family values are also very important and having a balance there what worries me is sometimes families because of work or other um, obstacles uh, just want to get the child out of the home so they can make sure they can you know do, do what it is they need to get taken care of mm -hmm. and that um, sometimes that's not always the answer to how our children um, form their values and receive some of these uh, nurturing nurturing um, lessons that they, they need to have growing up. Do you have any thoughts about that on how we strike that balance? It's challenging and that's a very complicated um, and insightful observation uh, in the sense that part of our pressures, are, it's not just about growing our children, it's about being able to, as a family, live and thrive in Hawaii. And that has to do with housing, transportation, jobs, multiple jobs, all of these things are, are complicated. Um, I agree with you. You know, I had the opportunity to stay at home with my children for over a year, and I had a lot of support from my employer and um, from my family to be able to do that, and that that made a big difference. Uh, Not everyone can do that, right. <laughs> so so that's what I mean about the complications that are beyond um, just what happens in this um, in the early learning board. It 
this has to do with more of the holistic um, conversations around how do we make um, Hawaii a place for people to be able to thrive. I recently had a conversation, maybe this is not so much about your board, but it is about balance. And um, we we're talking about children not going to kindergarten before they're five mm. because we changed that law. And of course there's you know certain people on different sides and they're saying, yeah, but I have to pay one more year of childcare. So <laughs> that's the only reason why they would want their child to go to kindergarten, like start in September, even though they're born in December uh, because of that cost and not necessarily what is best for the child. Um, so sometimes that worries me as we continue to push um, education and so forth on whether or not the child is really getting that education or being pawned off um, for the state to, to have to take <clears> care. <throat> um, but anyway, I don't think that we'll answer that question today, but certainly appreciate your willingness to serve. Thank and uh, if there are no other questions from yeah. uh, Senator Richards. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so my, you and I have had some of the conversations on this, but specifically, ge geographically speaking, Big Island is a big island versus mm -hmm. Oahu. Geographically, um, I think there's some challenges when we talk about early education. As a state board, how do you, how do you see this being able to address small geographical areas versus substantially large geographical areas? I think we need to have the information. And, you know, I had the lived experience being that mother of twins in Puna and my children changed childcare three times in one year. And I shared that in, in um, some of my testimony um, prior. Th those are all real challenges. And I, we, those are things we have to consider and figure out. And when we set, statewide policy on things that might impact different neighborhoods on the different islands in different ways. So that's what's very, very important. I'm appreciative that this board composition will be with people from the different geographic areas um, because there will be people from um, Hawaii Island and, and Maui and Kauai and, and hopefully they'll be able to bring um, those nuances in terms of access to the forefront. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Question, Senator uh, Hashimoto. Well, thanks. Thanks for that statement. I think I, as being a neighbor islander myself, I, I think you're going to play a very important role in bringing that geographic perspective. I think what, from from your first couple of meetings, do you feel that there is that other perspective of taking care of the rural communities? Uh, in sometimes more, you know, we, we're not in the urban core, you know, Big Island, Maui, Kauai, we sometimes we have to make sure that, you know, the policy is set with the mindset that there are other types of areas that you're going to have to serve. But has, has that been the forefront? And are you going to be the advocate for, for the neighbor islands? Well, I'm always the advocate for neighbor mm -hmm. islands. And people who know me know that that's usually how I come forth. Um, but we have, we're going to have a number of folks on the board who are advocating for their geographic um, distribution and what is the experience happening that way. I believe that this will always be a forefront for any kind of priority setting and decision making to make sure that a child in Kohala or Kau has the same access and experience that a child in an urban area in our state would have that's important okay well great I, I think I, I challenge you to continue that perspective because I think it's it's important I think <clears throat> sometimes when we get into decision making it, it sometimes we I, I think especially some with the with the staff they're they're looking at <clears throat> very logistical um, items and sometimes it's harder to to get a broader understanding of what, what's going on with the rest of the state and different models that need to be implemented so I think your, your voice will be very important in those discussions but I'm happy that we will we'll have strong representation from the neighbor islands. So thank you. I appreciate that invitation to continue that challenge. <laughs> thank you very thank you. much. Um, I do want to add just a perspective as an urban rep representative is that, you know, sometimes I admire and um, relish the, the um, rural areas. Yeah. And in fact, the families tend to be uh, much more um, well knitted together and that you do have stronger values because you don't have all of the 
um, distractions and stuff that mm. go on in the urban area. So while a lot of times we talk about the, the downfalls of being from a rural area, I think there's a lot of positiveness and we need to look at that and we need to strengthen that. So, and you guys can teach the urban areas some stuff. So thank you very much. Sure, just get yes. a couple of follow up. <clears throat> According to your resume, you develop a short film <coughs> To increase mental health, mental health help seeking behaviors on Pacific Islander male students, mm. and also uh, having a background with child abuse and neglect. Um, um, I don't say what the reason, but um, what, what did you get out of that <coughs> short film and, and and doing what you do with what you know about child abuse and with the uh, short film. The, the short film was created when I was at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And uh, at that time, I was overseeing our medical services, our mental health counseling, and also prevention education, which included sexual violence prevention and suicide prevention. At that time, when we were looking at our data, we found that it was young male Pacific Islanders who were less likely to access help seeking behaviors through our mental health counseling programs. We probably, most of us would know that, but you know, we looked at our data and that's what we were seeing. So we sought to do some additional outreach uh, in, connected to our amazing Pacific Island um, programming and services that happen at UH Hilo to um, create a path and a bridge utilizing Pacific Islander male voices to help with that outreach. Do you believe there is, should be a process if, if, if there is, if there isn't any at the time on early, early school education, identifying the harm that children has been exposed and also so have you addressed it? How did you address it? Uh, do you mind repeating the question? Are we talking? Yes, because the, the first part was around identifying um, any harm that the children has been exposed to. And if so, how would you have, how would you address it? Um, so as an educator, because I've been in a educator in the K to 12 system, if there was identification of harm, we were trained to be able to address it with both the student and get support from administrators and counselors uh, in, in that way. But part of being able to address it is to be able to identify signs and symptoms of harm that might be happening. The reason why I asked this question, um, I, I'm, I'm owning you, I'm a new guy here, mm -hmm. but looking at your background, especially coming back, coming from Hawaii Island, <clears throat> or whatever they decide to call the island, um, I really appreciate your background on, especially when it comes to mental health and abuse, because on Hawaii Island, you know, there's a lot of trials and tribulation for our kids, even going to public school, <clears throat> knowing that you're already talking about you having a hard time finding childcare in Puna mm -hmm. on, on, in that area on the, mm -hmm. on the difficulties of, of living in certain areas and getting things done. The reason why I bring this up is because as DOE, as, as early learning educators, I have a, I always have a big issue with that because this is where we're going to save our children from being victimized. And we are the first line of defense. And the reason why I say first line of defense is because I was a custodian and a security before I came into this square building. When I seen these things, I reported it, not only to the principal, but to HPD. I'm glad that you have this background going forward then maybe you can share your manao and try to push more with the early learning board to really observe signs of abuse because maybe the methods that I had learned 20 years ago <laughs> is not the same methods that we're learning now, mm -hmm. but the signs are similar of what they go through, especially what you was just explaining. So if you can, that's one of the requir requirements, requests that you help us with because our kids are dying and being abused and we are the only line of defense that these children have mm -hmm. is at our DOE school because they spend a lot of time with us so if you can give me that I, I appreciate it and another thing chair that I wanted to add is that I like at the end over here where you say I am here to serve 
Um, can you share what, 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 you know, what you mean by that? Because I, I like that terminology. So can you elaborate a little bit? Um, I feel a deep sense of kuleana to the communities that have embraced me and um, <coughs> that have also raised my children with me, um, that have invited me into my learning journey around, you know, the topics you're talking about with mental health and child abuse and neglect. I'm here to serve my community. I'm part of this community yeah. and we are raising our children together. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to GM 590, submitting for consideration and confirmation to the Early Learning Board, Grantory nominee Stephanie Shipton for a term to expire 6-30-2027. Uh, justifying again is Yuko. I stand on my written testimony. Thank you. Yuko. Anyone else here wishing to testify? Chair. Sure. Yes. Chair, sure, Member of the Committee, Keep my office my apologies for our last week of this morning, but I'll be standing um, in support of all of this nominee. Okay. For the Thank, you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? We do have a one from the principal of Kaneohe Elementary also in support. Okay, Stephanie, you are here. There she is. One minute or is it more no, than you can. <laughs> as long as we stay within some limited time, you're welcome to, to give your piece. <laughs> Great, I was scratching things out and trying quickly trying to shorten it. That but doesn't I, mean you can talk for an hour. <laughs> I promise I will be uh, mindful of your time. Um, good afternoon, Vice Chair Kim, uh, members of the Senate Education Committee. Thank you for your time and for your consideration of my nomination today. Um, I believe that a strong early learning ecosystem that inspires young people and empowers communities is critically important for the future of our state. This belief is born from my own experience growing up in a single parent household where I had the opportunity to attend quality daycares and public preschools, places where I learned and built friendships that last to this day. And I am forever grateful that for my own young children here in Hawaii, we have had access to similar resources. My two kiddos have explored Hawaiian culture and values alongside learning their ABCs somewhat um, through the parent participation program at Keikioka Aina. They have learned to malama Aina and deepen their relationship to our community and to Heiia through programs at Papahana Kua'ola. They've made lifelong friends through our participation in Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, Pico Pals program, which is a program for new parents of very young children. It's, you're eligible if your child is three months old to participate. And through the birthing classes that Best Birth Hawaii and Castle Hospital offer. They'll continue their learning um, at a Sunshine School, a preschool on the windward side of Oahu. My oldest is in her second year there now, and my son will be joining her in the fall. Um, that's right, my daughter turned four yesterday, and my son is just over two. So if you do the math, I have two within two years apart from each other. So I am a little bit tired today as I come to see you. And if you look closely, the washable marker on my foot is not as washable as the name claims it is. So I apologize for that. Um, but it's not just my experience as a daughter and a mother that brings me to this work. I have built a career in education policy, in systems change and program implementation. This career began as a classroom assistant in a pre-K classroom in Washington, DC, serving primarily El Salvadorian and Honduran students. I can hold diverse system perspectives, I can make connections, and I can dive into the details, all important skills for a board member with this important work in front of them. And I truly believe that transformational change requires a broad and diverse coalition of people with empathy and who are grounded in place. I believe that my orientation to leading through aloha, compassion, and connection will contribute to a strong board culture, a culture that fosters empowerment, nimbleness, and creativity. And I commit to operating from a place of possibility and curiosity, to coming to the work ready to engage, to listen, connect, and explore, and to be very clear on the importance of governance and accountability as the Early Learning Board sets forth on this new chapter. I'm excited about the opportunities to set clear strategic vision and direction, to make sure that we have easily accessible data to understand not only our progress, but also our challenges. 
The opportunity to build up a strong board structure that maximizes our ability to advise, to direct and provide recommendations to EOEL on how to improve not just quality, but availability and coordination of programs. These are all exciting opportunities in the next three years. And I look forward to how to work with EOEL on the training that will help not only their staff succeed, but help our board be effective. In the 12 years I have been in Hawaii, I have learned invaluable skills or invaluable lessons about myself, this place, and what it means to work alongside communities and other stakeholders. And should you choose to recommend me, I will bring that same passion for learning, for equity, to this work, along with an open mind to diverse perspectives, experiences and contexts, and an orientation to possibility and curiosity. So thank you again for your consideration. Thank you, Stephanie. Members, any questions? Senator Richards. Thank you. Uh, thank you for agreeing to step up. A couple of questions. You said Kiki Okaina, mm -hmm. so why may I? Uh, all over. They have programs all over. So the my okay. daughter attended the program in Kaneohe, okay. and they just opened a Kailua campus, and that's the one my son and I go to on okay. Tuesday and Thursday mornings. They have one in Kaneohe Valley as well. They do, yeah. And in Pearl City. We'll be at their Pearl City campus tomorrow learning about the water system. And then you know, so you, you listed Mahina. She's my friend. So um, question now. Um, you've heard some of the comments that were made on previous candidate geographical concerns, but also something that Senator Kim brought up concerning family structure mm -hmm. and regional, I guess I'd call it regional family structure versus being spread out because of jobs or whatever the case may be. What are your thoughts on all of that? So for <clears throat> one of the things I've appreciated that the, the preceding board has implemented, it seems like they've made a lot of space for voice whether that's multiple opportunities for public input within the same meeting agenda, or making sure that they're always asking the question of whose voices haven't been represented here and how can we incorporate those voices. I think that's something that is an opportunity for the new board to continue to explore. How are we making sure that not just our perspectives or the perspectives of the folks leading organizations are included, but also how are we getting out into communities where we represent in order to hear what's happening on the ground, what's happening in classrooms, what's happening for families, so that all of that can inform our decision making. Um, and then to your question about family structure, you know, my, we have been fortunate enough that we've been able to sort of cobble together different types of childcare. My daughter was born at the height of lockdown. Um, we didn't make it to the hospital in time for her to be born because we were so worried about the restrictions about who could and couldn't be in the room that she ended up being born in our shower, thankfully, without any complication. Um, and so, and that's a story for another time, I'm sure. Um, but we've been privileged that I was able to step back from, from work when it was too much having two children under the age of two, that I can attend these programs with my children, that you know we could work from home and work remotely that we have somewhat of a support system but i know that that experience isn't true for all of the families here and i think what's important for the early learning board and eoel to consider is how do we make sure that not having those privileges is a barrier to quality education how do we make sure that every child regardless of where they live at least has access to quality learning or early learning opportunities and if we can hold that central, I think it can help us to look beyond not just the education system, but what are the other things that need to be in place to support families to be able to make those choices. Okay, um, and I'm agreeing with you. One of, the, one of the premises that I've had concerns is that we all work so many different jobs that we lose the family structure and we backfill it by having early childhood care, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Short term, we're okay, but I worry about the long term because we don't have that family structure. And something Kurt, um, Senator Favela was talking about having those support structures because, you know, um, teen suicide and all those demographics that maybe we're missing. And I think if we can get a good crack at it early on, maybe we can solve some of that. So. I appreciate you willing to do it. I have nine-year-old twins, so I get it. <laughs> I get the part about being tired. And I will say I have 
been so grateful for programs like Keiki Oka'aina and the work happening at Papahana Kua'ola where I can go with my children. We can learn together and I can build relationships with other parents that are kind of in it with me as our, our kids are going through similar stages. Um, and so I think those types of programs in the ecosystem alongside public preschool and other things are just invaluable. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I wanna uh, build on what he said um, on the long term, because as serving on this board, early learning, you tend to only focus in on the early learning aspect of it, but that's just the beginning of the journey that they take, and that's the foundation. And uh, it concerns me that I have not seen as much demand as I have recently, uh, last so many years, and not only with COVID, but before COVID, the need for mental health therapists, the need for mental health services. And it makes me stop and pause and, and ponder what might be causing that in our young people. I think some of it is being more aware, but the other is there seems to be a lot of pressure on our, our, our young people to start them early in school, get early learning. And then when they get into school, you know, the competition and then um, declaring what your pathway is going to be. And then early college. Uh, Stressing and, me out right now. Yeah, early college. <laughs> and you're not even through with high school and you're thinking about getting credits because you want to be ahead of everybody else. So you don't enjoy your college life. You don't enjoy the sports and the elected electives. And I know I, I was on the yearbook staff and stuff like that. and. and the, pep squad and because everyone's pressuring them out that they have so many credits so they have their associate degree by the time they graduate from high school <laughs> that the pressure on some of these kids and I've had yeah. them work for me in my office mm -hmm. and they're bright and they're quick but there's some issues that they, they have and they have to go see a therapist so I hope that that's something that and that's why I speak on balance mm -hmm. because they really need that I mean the push for everybody to to get through. And these kids see the other kids do it, and they want, they don't want to be left behind. And some of them are, can handle it, but others can't, right? So um, that's something I hope that you consider. Um, I have one child, he's obviously 34 now, but I know how difficult it is. And with two, and that young age that you have, uh, I'm wondering as far as time, do you have the time to put in to service and you know, not um, shortchange your children because of your service to, to, to government? Yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking it. Um, I'm very fortunate that we have a strong family structure here. You know, my dad looks forward to his grandpa days on Monday and Wednesday with my son. Um, my daughter is in preschool right now, and so when we made that decision as a family for her to start preschool is because we could see that she was looking for more social experiences. She was so advanced in terms of her language skills that I knew I was doing a disservice to her to kind of keep her home with me all day. Um, so that was a really long conversation we had. I cried a lot when we <laughs> dropped her off. Um, and she's thriving there. And I know, I look at my son and I know he will do the same this fall, but I know that's not true for all students and for all young people. Um, my son will be there in the fall. And so that opens up a lot of time on, on my plate. I, I also resigned from my sort of full-time professional career last May because I wanted to be more intentional about how I spent my time. I carved out a section, a chunk of time that would be for things that I care about that I'm passionate about, that I can see will have impact. Um, this is one of those things. So I've done the equations to figure out, you know, what is it my children will need from me? How can I be the parent that I want to be for them and be present to the things that I care about? So we've we've talked about it as a family. Because <coughs> as they say, if you want something yeah. done, give it to a busy woman too. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? But luckily, yes. <laughs> but luckily, I had a good system, um, support system. My mom and dad, and mm -hmm. and so I went to work, you know, knowing that they were, he he was well taken care of, yeah. and that allowed me to serve as well. So, uh, congratulations to you for having that. But, uh, no questions about. Yeah, 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 I get I get questions. I get questions. Uh, and I love you. What word you say? Sorry. The question is: Do we have carryovers for this early learning board? After uh, the term over? No, I think. Oh, shucks. We better put down in then. <laughs> anyway, because 2027 is too, too, too short. Um, what, what, what I'm 
seen over here. Of course, you're not going to catch my eye because I'm a graduate of James Campbell High School. So I'm going to ask you the question. So you're at James Campbell High School um, and you was working with the Human Services Academy Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. So how was that? How was that? With, because I know we're doing all of these academies and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So when, what, what year was that and uh, how, how was it for you? Oh gosh, you're asking me to remember years. Um, it was That's three short. children. So it was BC before children. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say it was in 2018, mm -hmm. 2019. It was when um, Lord Ryan Lazardo was just starting it up. I'm not sure if you're familiar yeah. with him. He's, he's at Chamber of Commerce now, yeah. was um, a teacher at Campbell High School for a long time. He was a returning alum who returned to the school to teach. And he was the one who helped start the academy program. Um, my experience with that was they did an incredible job bringing in community members and finding the right community members to dig into different questions about the types of curricular approaches and policies at their school that would help move it forward. I was there for the very beginning stages of it, so I haven't seen how it's come to fruition since then. Um, but at the time, it felt like they were asking the right questions, bringing in the right people, and trying to just be really curious and innovative in what they did. Yeah, because I was working at Campbell at that time when they first started the academy. My custodian, I was the bathroom by the cafeteria. Uh -huh. That was my area. Just listening to what you give, the reason why I say this, Chair, is, is They're that... They're being for Campbell. So. Uh, no, no, no more Campbell, sorry. <clears throat> Sabres. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is that what, what you guys are bringing, with the previous person and yourself, is not the knowledge, not only the knowledge that you have as being a parent, but knowing the value of having that and how you know that get other kids and other families out there that don't have what you have because sometimes the disconnect mm -hmm. is that what you mean what you mean your kid cannot do this my kid do it see what i heard from both of you guys you guys connect to that and that's what we really need in early learning because it's hard when you get teachers or people try to push policies and procedures that don't connect with the families and the kids because that's the problem, you know? And then ex exactly what uh, uh, Senator Richard said, you know, my concern is deeply, and I'm gonna share this again, is our youth's suicide, yeah? During COVID in my district, I'm not gonna say my district, but my district that falls into a big district area, I'm not gonna say where, we lost three teenagers not more than 17 years old by suicide during COVID. And we want to do everything that we can to address these things. And I think early learning, what you guys are sharing with the chair and the rest of the committee, I think we're on a, on a, on a great path, but we can do more, as the uh, chair said, to, to really recognize the, the need for mental health in, in the early learning stages so that they can be productive uh, citizens. So thank you for your service. Appreciate you. Okay. I don't mean to cut anybody off, but one, yeah, of, I, our, I know. one of our members have to I'm catch sorry. a plane. So we're going to depart from the norm and um, vote on the first two because he doesn't want to miss okay. all four votes. So um, just remember we're doing this for you. <laughs> I appreciate the member's consideration. So I'm just going to go right into decision-making on the first two GMs for the early learning uh, board. Uh, for GM 589, um, for the confirmation of Soma Gandhi, the recommendation is to advise and consent. Any discussion, members? Hearing none, the chair votes aye. Chair votes aye. Senator Hashimoto? Aye. Senator Favela? Yeah, aye. And I vote aye. Chair, you have four in favor. The motion Thank is you. adopted. And for GM 590, this is for the consideration confirmation for Stephanie Shipton, uh, the recommendation is to advise and consent, and chair votes on. Motion is to advise and consent. Chair votes aye. aye. Senator Hashimoto. Aye. Senator Richards votes aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Chair, you have four in favor. Thank Motion you. is adopted. So we're going to go on to GM 522. And I know that Senator Hashimoto would, would love to stay, but because of other commitments, he has to leave. Uh, so that's nothing against the two nominees that are coming up. Okay. 
Uh, with that, we are on GM 522, submitting for consideration and confirmation to the Hawaii Teachers Standard Boards, gubernatorial, gubernatorial nominee Deo Matsuura for a term to expire 6-30-2026. And testifying is Osatui from uh, HSTA. Anybody here? Testifying in person, seeing none. Uh, let's see, we have testimony written from Sean, Sean Wong and from Susan uh, Rocco, both in support, uh, principal of Roosevelt High School, Sean Wong. So anyone else wishing to testify on this nominee? If not, uh, Dale, if you would like to come forward. Okay, you're welcome to give opening remarks about yourself and why you want to serve. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Vice Chair Kim and members of the Education Committee. My name is Dale Matsuura, and I'm a Student Services Coordinator at Roosevelt High School. Um, I've been in the DOE for over 23 years um, between Kawananakoa and Roosevelt High School. I served as a special education um, reading and science teacher and then a curriculum coordinator, and then now finally in my role as a student services coordinator. Um, I have three children in the DOE system, um, a, a second grader at Manoa Elementary, a middle schooler at Stevenson Middle, and um, my son attends Roosevelt with me. And so um, I'm glad to answer any questions. How is that having a child uh, at the school? With um, you? I see I, it on TV a lot. <laughs> uh, I think that's more a question for, for him. him right? yeah. <laughs> but it's good for me. It's like to ask me, how is it having your son here in the same building with you? <laughs> it's different. Okay, members, questions? I just, I just get one question. Depending on what they say, I might come. I mean, anyway, okay. what I'd like to see that you know that. Um, time, right? Especially with your special education background, um, what, what do you think the challenges are as a special education teacher now um, as um, in the previous past? The reason why I say that is because I, I know when I was going to school, the special education um, system was they, different. The kids had classes that they would be in all day, and then you had a home-based teacher you had a uh, special education coordinator that overseeing all the teachers. Now it's in inclusion. Mm -hmm. You know, can can you share your experience on the inclusion and how you know it differs than than going um, like before? Um, so. I believe that the inclusion, I'm an advocate of um, inclusive education to the um, greatest extent possible, and that um, allows the students an opportunity to get rigorous instruction um, as best they can alongside their peers. Um, I, this is, you know, this push um, in Hawaii is somewhat more recent, um, and I know schools at Roosevelt, we do offer um, a lot of inclusion classes uh, as compared to many other areas. We, um, I, and I do think in the high school, you just have more funding, you have more student body mm -hmm. um, size so that you have the opportunity to do that in the high school yes. setting. Yeah. yeah. The only reason why I say that is because in my community, I've been having a lot of uh, um, concerns that their student with the inclusion is being prior to the inclusion now they're being bullied because they have their teacher assisting with the regular teacher in the inclusion so when they leave classes they're getting picked on knowing that they are in, in special education class the reason why i bring this up is because previously mm -hmm. nobody knew he was in a special education learning disability emotionally handicapped unless you're on a wheelchair mm -hmm. um, knew that you was in special ed mm -hmm. because the classes was secluded mm -hmm. i'm not saying that's the best mm -hmm. way but going forward being on the early you know doing this early learning or can you guys look into a way of collaborating with with both sides because it is important to have a social inclusion but if it's going to cause them to be bullied and not be able to um, um, produce, um, uh, you know, their regular work. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, because I see it on both sides that is good. I understand what you're saying, but 
as the early learning board, as you go up <coughs> and start having this process, can you kind of intertwine or kind of entertain something like that when you guys, you know, doing the, you guys, whatever you guys do, that. <laughs> you know what I mean, right, Chair? Okay, thanks, sir. That's about it. I, I promise I'm not gonna come back. You promise. I Pinky promise. promise. Okay. Um, sure. Sure. Yes. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So you've heard the conversations previously about geography, mm -hmm. urban versus rural. Mm -hmm. um, what some of your thoughts on that, specific, specifically as it relates to? We're talking about teacher standards certification but then also recertification mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things evolve over time and what's your perspective on that because i have my own thoughts as far as maybe some of our rural schools so the rural schools do just naturally have more difficult time retaining and recruiting teachers in general and um and so, and then I'm sure their access to getting professional development and recertification is an added difficulty on top of that. So um, hopefully my participation in the teacher standards board, we can collaborate and discuss these issues. And, and also um, I am on the Hawaii, the HSTA joint special education um, committee with the DOE and hopefully together we can Bridge because that's my that's my priority is retaining and recruiting highly qualified teachers. I, and that recruiting teachers is difficult mm -hmm. at best, and I know housing's an issue. We, we have all of those challenges ahead of us. Um, I just want to be sure that we, you know, what the terminology is, leave kids behind as we're trying to fix something. I worry that we have a few years of kids that as we're changing our program or identifying it we don't attend to those kids we fix it for later kids but those kids are kind of in a never never land um thoughts on that um in terms of um well if if we have a problem with a, a program the recertification mm -hmm. say we may get a couple of kids or a, a couple of years where we're not getting a very good education mm -hmm. And though we fix the problem, mm -hmm. for those kids, mm -hmm. it's a lifetime and we may miss them. Is there a way, and you, I don't expect an answer from mm -hmm. you, but this is a concern I've had. Um, thoughts on that? So I noticed something similar when my son was entering elementary and there was a shift to Common Core mm -hmm. from HSA to Common Core. And you know the math, the change in math acquisition um, it put some students in a gap mm -hmm. in, in that adjustment period. And so, um, you know, that is a difficult, um, <laughs> that's a difficult situation for those kids to be in. But hopefully, you know, with the Hawaii Teacher Standards Board and having highly qualified teachers in every classroom, um, no matter what the shift is, those qualified teachers will identify students through the help of the systems in the school. So, you know, to me, the most important thing is getting those teachers in the classroom because that's, like you said, the first line. That's how you're gonna um, identify the kids and make sure people don't fall through the gaps. And I would ask that you keep that in mind as we go through some of the stuff. That's all, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Dale, you have been serving on the board for a while? Uh, no. Uh, just two meetings so oh, far. Oh, just two yeah. meetings. Okay, so in that two meetings, because I, I noticed on your question number four about the board staff um, and then not communicate or interact with members of the legislature or other entities without board knowledge or approval. Has there been a problem or something? No, I just, um, we, I had a um, orientation. So in my first orientation meeting, that was one of the things that were told to me. So um, that was the knowledge is um, that we operate by sunshine. We don't um, meet more than, you know, three people at a time. Well, two people can meet, but not, not three or more because of the appearance of um, you discussing board things outside. Okay, but the interact with members of the legislature, it says uh, you wrote or other into without board knowledge or approval. So, so you have to have approval to talk to us? I think <laughs> if we're going in a group of three or more, I see. then we would need to, yeah. 
but if individually I could, if two of us, then we could. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you are re you are referring to the actual board and not necessarily the actual the board staff. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. That, that clears it up. Uh, what is the relationship with the uh, director of the of the uh, teacher standard board? Um, Who's the head of the teacher standard board? Not the on the board, but the, the executive director. The executive director, um, Felicia. Felicia. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. No, I was just I didn't realize uh, she was here. I just didn't see her on the testifiers list, so I was just a little bit. And then I read that about your about the staff, so I wasn't sure who you were referring to um, when you talked about that. Um, you um, in question number five, you, you didn't really respond to the question about transparency okay, I and thought accountability. <laughs> so at every board meeting, um, Executive Director Villa Lobo, she shows us her meeting um, and all of the things that she participates in, and she aligns that with the standards that she's rated to. Um, so that's one area that we um, are accountable and transparent with her on what she does. Um, yeah. And I think as I sit in on more meetings, um, then I will see the transparency and, and work together with her more. Okay. And, but you think that transparency and accountability is important, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, that's part of the board. And I know the board, you have like 17 members on the board, so that's a large board. Um, um, so I'm not sure in your two meetings, have you? So of... we do have um, committees. So I've gotten to know uh, a little bit the um, people in my two committees a little bit more. But yes, it is a larger board, and we are meeting virtually still. So. So I don't get to know, I haven't gotten to know them yet <coughs> that well. What kind of attendance has you seen um, in the two month, two times you've been in the So I've seen um, almost perfect attendance, oh, maybe um, someone, one person may be absent, but almost perfect attendance. Okay, good. Members, any other questions? I promise you I'll You promise you wasn't? Yeah, okay. So I'll okay. just hold it. Uh, okay, you got one more person you can yeah, lay it out on. I'm just going to because some of us got to go pick a ball after this. So. <laughs> oh, you play pick a ball. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate your answers. Okay, we are on the last agenda item, Senator Favela. Thank you. GM523, submitting for confirmation and consideration to the Hawaii Teacher Standard Board gubernator gubernatorial nominee, Dondra Okzaki, for a term to expire 6-30-2026. Testifying, uh, a note Ted Ushijima, Assistant Superintendent um, for the Department of Education in support, written only, Stan Tamashiro, Principal, testifying for Evra Elementary School in support. And with that, Dantra, would you like to give opening remarks? Aloha Vice Chair Kim and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dantra Wasaki, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to seek confirmation to be a member of the Hawaii Teacher Standards Board. I have 23 years of teaching experience in various roles, such as a classroom teacher, an inclusion teacher, um, English language learner teacher, an instructional coach. Um, I've also been a member of the instructional leadership team, and I'm a current student services coordinator at my school. Okay, well, um, I, I wish to serve as a member of the Hawaii Teacher Standards Board because I want to support policies and standards that promote teaching excellence. Okay, thank you. Senator Favela, your question. Yeah, that's a nice background. Where is that? <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's my daughter actually uh, graduated uh, two, a year ago from Boston. And so this is actually uh, the background of the house that we rented. Oh. <laughs> thank you. So I took the picture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. No question. Yeah. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, wow. My son graduated out of Boston as well. I don't recognize that, but it's very nice. <laughs> Senator Richards, do you have anything? I can yeah. ask questions while you... Um, no, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, talk about the distance learning program you've been involved with. 
Sure. Um, last year, I was in, um, an instructional coach for the state distance learning program. It was a K-12 program that provided um, distance and virtual learning for students across the state of Hawaii. And so I was the elementary coach. And so we serve students in kindergarten to fifth grade. And then we have a staff that delivers online instruction to students in elementary. And uh, was this born out of the, the COVID era and it was, still carrying over? It did. It, it was born out of that era out of need. And then it did carry over to the next year. And then this past year, I wasn't with the program because I uh, returned to my um, current school in a different position, but um, they were able to serve students who were affected by the Maui fire. And they were okay. able to um, bring aboard some of those students to provide them with education. And I assume you've been listening to the conversation about um, certification, recertification, attracting teachers, urban versus rural, comments on any of that? Um, I actually grew up on the island of Kauai. I'm, um, I graduated, I, I attended elementary all the way to high school on Kauai. So I understand um, coming from a rural area. Um, my parents were also educators on Kauai. And so I think that it's important to um, be able to provide those types of things for teachers out in those rural areas. I think um, using virtual options could be something that you know we could utilize because it could reach a wider audience. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Mm -hmm. Dondra, uh, just a couple of questions on your uh, response. In question four, you do state that you expect staff to provide exceptional, exceptional customer service um, and your opinion, are they? I think that they are. Um, as, as a classroom teacher, before I had um, experiences with the board, um, you know, it was time to renew your license. It was time to turn in your paperwork. And I've always gotten prompt responses from the staff. Um, I, if I had a question, I was able to email and utilize the website and um, get the information that I needed. Okay. You also state that regarding your goals and expectation for board staff, you noted that you hold high standards for professionalism, responsiveness, and accuracy when interacting with members of the legislative body and other entities. How do you ensure that this is being uh, adhered to? I think that um, during our meetings, we will share what, um, you know, what, what will be shared with the legislature. Um, in addition, I think that sharing of information and making sure that the information that we have that is accurate is going to be shared. So when you say share, you mean not just share among the board members, but shared with the staff as well? Shared with staff as well as needed. And um, like we, we took a look at um, some items at our last meeting. I'm sorry, I only, I only attended one meeting so far because I'm a brand new board member but I was impressed at how we took a look at some of the items and made revisions to it to make sure that um, what we were asking or what we were trying to communicate was clear and accurate. Okay, good. And finally, uh, what intrigued me is you stated a concern that since joining the board, the occurrence of teachers obtaining Hawaii teaching license but not actively teaching within the state. Uh, how, yeah, that is something. Uh, how prevalent is that? Um, I think that it is, it is something that's of a concern. I think uh, as far as its prevalence, I need to learn a little bit more about it. Being a new board member, it's something that I just learned about. And I was actually very surprised that there are teachers who do not teach in the state of Hawaii that hold a, hold a Hawaii teaching license. And I believe very strongly that we need to make sure that we keep those teachers in the state of Hawaii and they, they, they serve our students in the state of Hawaii because we do hold them to high standards. I, I agree with you. So I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, do you feel that a policy or statutory change is needed to ensure that we can, you know, I know you, it's not going to be a perfect record, but we certainly want it. Um, I think in order to help retain teachers in the state of Hawaii or maybe even recruit teachers to the state of Hawaii, it would be good 
to um, ensure that if they have a state of Hawaii teaching license, they should be teaching in our state. Why, why do you think that someone would go through the whole trouble of getting their teaching license and then not actively teach? They get another job, higher paying job or I not in the area it they could, want? It could be that um, they might have been attracted to another job that pays higher. Maybe it's the location. They want to live in a different location. Um, I would have to learn more about why, you know, the causes of people getting a white teacher's license and never using it in the state. I think um, it was kind of surprising to me that so many people would have a Hawaii teacher's license but not be here teaching. Well, I look forward to you taking the lead on this and if you can, or the executive director can get back to us regarding what that numbers might be, um, it might be illuminating. So uh, appreciate that. Members, any other questions of our nominee? Uh, yeah, just, are you, you, are you currently at Eva Elementary still yet, no? I am, I am. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just say that because before I got elected, I tell you the truth, I live Eva Beach all my life, and I never heard of the Lincoln Day celebration, believe it or not. So that's how Eva Beach and Eva was separated. Never knew until I came on elected official, but that's one of the most traditional programs that I've ever been a part of, and you guys do a great job every year. So. Thank you for that. Appreciate it, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Members, we'll go into, right into decision making. Uh, recommend GM 522 for the consideration and confirmation of gubernatorial nominee for the Teacher Standard Board, Dale Matsuura, to uh, advise and consent. Any discussion? Hearing none, Chair votes aye. Chair votes aye. Senator Hashimoto is excused. Senator Richard votes aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, you have three in favor. Thank you very much. And enough. for GM 523, for the consideration confirmation to the Hawaii Teacher Standard Board, gubernatorial nominee, Dondra Ozaki, uh, advise and consent. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, chair votes aye. Chair votes aye. Senator Richards votes aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, you have three in favor. Motion is adopted. Thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned. Meeting.